Okay, we're now live. Um, Martin, thanks for coming and welcome everybody, guys. Um, just a quick reminder, my name is Maria JD. I'm here with Martin Verhoeven and uh, that's Monster Challenge Day 2. We've got a lot of ground to cover again, a lot of stuff. So, um, hi, Martin. Let's check hey, the hey. connection. Yeah, yeah. You hear me? Everything's fine? Everything is perfect. Everything okay. is perfect. Right. Uh, yeah. And I see that we've got already a bunch of people here. Hey, guys. Thanks for coming back. Say hi in the chat um, so that we can hear who is around. Uh, yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, send us a lot of likes so that we know that you guys hear us. Okay. But let's just make sure that everybody can hear us. Just, you know, send us something. So <laughs> that, Give us okay. a message. I'm like, yes, please. Like, I don't want to be talking alone. <laughs> don't want to understand that I was like, you know, solo show for like half an hour. <laughs> okay. So, um, like, Martin, today you are uh, the MC. Well, okay, I'm going to be helping. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, the plan is, the plan is to go through the monster workflow, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> kind of thing that I'm going kinda. to show is, uh, is let's say my workflow or how, how I approach projects and especially in my personal work that you can see now on the big screen, the art station page, 99% what's on there is personal work. Uh, I don't often share client work, uh, because yeah. let's say I've, yeah. The personal stuff so people, somebody's so. saying, hey, Monster Boy, I'm pretty sure that's Marlon. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we know that. Probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We know that a bunch of people are hearing us. Amazing. Thanks, guys. Um, just, you know, Martin, then before we go into your workflow, yeah. the Monster Boy workflow, <laughs> let's, uh, uh, can we start with a little bit of intro? Um, I know that you're in Belgium and I can, you know, be talking a lot about you. Um, so can you update everyone and myself included on, you know, what are you doing recently? What keeps you busy? Just kind of, uh, you know, this kind of stuff. Yeah. So currently, let's say my position is being a concept sculptor. And that actually means that you're in, um, in the concept design phase. And quite often I get uh, the idea or the brief on paper. And instead of people contacting a 2D concept artist, I jump in 3D in ZBrush. And yeah, try to, to uh, um, bid to their wishes, you know, like I, I try to create whatever they want. And I'm working for uh, films, uh, collectibles and, and miniatures also. So it's like spread mm -hmm. out. Uh, so I do a lot of stuff also for 3D printing, like, you know, you know. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Um, and that's mainly what I do and I do it uh, practically uh, uh, full time, but I jump in from one project to the other. So today could be movies next week, next week could be miniatures. So it's like, I try to spread my talent as, as, as broad as possible to get yeah the most jobs as possible, of course. Yeah, with definitely. That I can do. Yeah. And, uh, I bet a lot of art hero students know you from, uh, the 3d printing course. Um, so, uh, I'm sure that, uh, a bunch of people in the stream have seen you before. Definitely, <laughs> definitely, definitely. <laughs> okay, so um, that's cool. And Marlon, uh, Marlon, oh no, Marlon, no, Martin. Yeah. <laughs> Why so many names? Start with Mar. <laughs> um, so um, I know, I see there is your art station right here. Yeah. So yeah, is that what we're starting from? Yeah, yeah, like... Uh... The thing that I want to show quickly is like my art station page because a lot of people always are wondering like what do you do the whole time? Like the thing is like when I'm working and I'm more not and I don't have a job from nine to five, I still work. So these are the things that I do when I don't have an official job, but I still produce art to get better in your portfolio and everything. And um let's say most of these things that I work on, I don't spend more than one day, two days on it. Uh, but it's just to keep the flow of everything. Um and especially let's say with the workflow, how I approach things or discover shapes. For me, it's a very fast way to get ideas out of there. So for instance, let's say this guy, I did this guy yesterday in the late afternoon, uh, early evening, but it's something that I can bash out quickly, throw out an idea and jump onto the next project. So 
that's the thing. Very like, cool. So, um, like, guys, if you have any questions, it's time to start asking because we'll try to make this session as interact interactive as possible, okay? So I'm going to be helping Martin with the questions, and I'm just going to actually uh, kick off this uh, Q&A session, Martin. So, yeah, okay. um, like, that was a, you, you just said that was a quick sculpt. So yeah. did you start uh, from a, a base mesh or that nope. was just... Oh, no, okay. so I don't start from base meshes, and that's what I'm going to show you now, actually. Like, when I'm sculpting, most of the times, like, I start with a sphere, very simple. And the biggest thing that I always use, like, I first modify my brushes quickly. So I'm just using the standards, uh, uh, 38, or alpha, and the standard brush. Um, I pull down the lazy mouse, because that gives a lag when you're sculpting, and that's the stuff that I hate. And the roll distance, pull it open completely. And the other brush that I also use is uh, the clay buildup. I modify this also the alpha quickly. And also the stroke settings. So lazy step back to zero and the roll distance back to 10. And then the other one that I tend to use the most is the inflate brush. And a lot of people don't use it for sculpting, but I love to sculpt with it. And the only thing that I do in the preset is like I'll dial it up until let's say roughly around 40 on the Z intensity. And then I just start looking for shapes. And like in this case, when I start working on, on, on a full figure, most of the times when I build up my shapes, I start from the torso and then I work to the head and the arms and everything. Um, but when I start working on a piece, nine times out of 10, I already have the concept in my head. And the only thing that I need to do is actually jump into ZBrush and try to put it on, let's say not paper, but put it on the screen, yeah, right? Yeah, on the canvas. Yeah. So, um, cool, and uh, uh, just kind of a follow-up question. Yeah. You said the, the concept is in your head. Uh, do you use like references or mood board or sketching? Like in your case, would it be just like straight on the canvas? Yeah, in this case, it's straight on the canvas. I'm not using any, any uh any references, like if, if I need references, I look up for pictures and I have a second screen in my setup and I just throw a lot of uh, uh, images on there, but everything's done directly uh, um, on the screen when I want to discover shapes. So like, let's say in this case, like I have a torso in mind. So by using also the sculptors, like I keep my poly count low while I'm sculpting, right? right. And what I do is like, I just start roughly and let's say if this will be torso or something, I'm just going to- I'll, I'll, I'll shoot you a few questions meanwhile. Yeah, sure. So um, guys are asking, oh, I'll start with Artyom, is asking how do you get time and energy for personal art after work? Uh, <laughs> that's a good one. Well, to be honest, like the reason why I started freelancing is actually to make up my own schedule and to plan in these things, you know, like I even say no to some jobs sometimes if I feel like I have the, the, the need to really produce art or really do something or I try to fit it into my schedule that I say like, okay, like tomorrow morning, I can put in some extra time to do something for myself uh, and push back the other job a tiny bit to, to create art, you know? Uh, and the inspiration is something that comes automatically for me. Like when I'm not doing anything, like my brain, yeah, fires off and, and I get some ideas, so. <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, funny enough, actually, I'm looking at your sculpt and I already probably start recognizing a few elements of your style. Um, I'm not sure if I've been looking too much at your art station. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, but it's it's something. I'm not that, like some creep or anything, by the way. <laughs> no, but that's 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 the that's the thing that a lot of people say. Like, oh, you have a, a familiar style that that's recognizable. But uh, the thing is, like, I don't have to think about these things, you know. When I'm sculpting, I'm just looking for shapes. In, in this case, like, I'm looking for a rib cage. And uh, for me, like, like the flow of lines and organic shapes is something that I really enjoy making. And now, like, I just try to push in all those, let's say, rips in this case. Right. And for me, it's also, to, it's important to work with sculptors and keep your poly count, try to keep it as low as possible because we're still blocking in in this stage, right? Um, yeah. Okay, one more question here. Yeah. Um, 
Arnold, uh, hey Martin, what resin printer would you recommend for first time printing? Oof, that's that's a difficult one. Like it depends. Like you have uh, uh, a lot of of, of uh, cheaper, um, let's let's say Chinese printers that are on the market right now, and they're pretty good in the quality that they bring. Uh, the only thing that is less than, let's say, bigger brands like uh, uh, Formlabs or something, because those are way more expensive than printers, but it's the support that you get from a company. So if something breaks down or something, and let's say the brand that you choose for is more high profile, um, the support also probably will, will be better for the company. Um, but if you want to start out with a, with a resin printer, I wouldn't say like go for this brand or that brand, but just just try to... to stay in within a certain uh, um, budget that you're willing to give to something. Like if you say it's purely hobby and I want to learn some stuff, try to buy a printer below 500 uh, um, euros. Yeah. But the thing is like, okay, the quality will be there, but your building volume will, will be smaller. The setup of the supports will be harder. Um, and yeah, if you use other programs uh, or let's say, sorry, other printers, uh, that are more expensive, like the slicing software will be more, uh, let's say, focused uh, on, on yeah the thing that you did budget-wise, you know? Right, yeah. Yeah, I think we actually focused quite a bit on um, slicing and engineering during yeah. the program, during the 3D printing program. But, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, we talk a little bit about printers. Well, a little bit is like uh, for, like, an hour and a half or so mm -hmm. <laughs> but still it's like uh, uh technology changes all the time so uh and also you can outsource 3d printing if you're a beginner right martin yeah yeah, yeah perfectly you can I mean, perfectly you don't need to um start uh with a piece we, we actually you know like since we're talking about 3d printing i'm just gonna show off here we just had this piece delivered um like uh martin you haven't seen this yet actually no. marlon marlon used your methodology to 3d print this girl and check this out cool. check check this out you're gonna see something it's actually it's it's sliding perfectly on the board yeah. and it's holding it's ho she's holding the grip like without falling i mean like uh, when uh, uh, Marlon did that and it arrived finally with the COVID, it was like four months delayed. But he was like, Martin's methodology works. <laughs> <laughs> but did he anyway. think that, it was, uh, that I was always bullshitting him? <laughs> no, no, you were not. That's like, guys, this is a proof. <laughs> this, yeah, I was not planning to show that, but, you know, I have to give Martin some merit. Well, it's it's to to be honest, like uh, um, the whole engineering part and everything, it's it's fairly straightforward. You just have to uh, know what you're doing, you know, where you put the keys and everything, or where you put the cuts, and then it's like like a very simple process. But you also have to think like if you produce something that it's uh, recostable, um, if you want to have resin copies or something, uh, yeah. except one uh, one three D print. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, we've got a bunch of questions. I'll start little by little. Uh, yeah. So a question from Bruno. Um, any advice about sculpting miniatures? I don't know. Well, Martin? <laughs> um, to be honest, like the, the miniature in industry is very... Um, it's an interesting industry, to say the, le uh, the least of, of it. Uh, like you have professional companies and you have a lot of amateur companies and it's very important to know who you're dealing with. Uh, but purely focusing, let's say, on the sculpting thing, the, the reference that I always give people, um, don't go overboard on detail. Detail is important. <laughs> yeah, that's what Bruno said as a follow-up. I know that the most important is to have a good shape in the composition yeah. and not fall into a lot of unnecessary details. Yeah, and... Yeah, and, and the simple trick that I always tell people when they're starting out, like even when you're working for, for quarter scale stuff, like scale the things down on your screen until it's like the actual size visually. And if you don't pick up the details anymore on your screen, that means that it won't get printed. So. Right. Okay. Okay. That's a good tip. That's a good tip. Um, okay. And then another one. Um, what's the best way to start in the miniatures industry? 
have graduated, have portfolio, but they are mostly jobs for game artists in my country. Uh, I would say the best way to start in the miniature industry is just get your work out of there. And especially uh, um, when you're starting out, I would say make sure that you have uh, physical copies that you take pictures of. So, oh, wow. Okay, interesting. So, so, so 3D print a few pieces for yourself that you can take pictures of that you can use as, as, as a reference also. Like, okay, look, this is something that I made. That's how it looks in the physical world. Like that, that's always an extra thing when you uh, um, show your stuff to people that you also know like how to engineer stuff and that it works because quite often people contact me and they say like, hey, does this look good? And, 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 and like I did all the engineering and when I look at it, I'm thinking like, yeah, you did some cutting and slicing on your model, but when you would put it together or cast it, like, like it will fall apart completely. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's important to know like how your stuff will behave in the physical world. Um, right. Yeah, that's, yeah. I think it's actually also pretty cool when you, when you just have a physical model and it's a proof, it's a just, yeah, the work yeah, yeah. And, is there. And, and the benefit, of course, of, 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 of miniatures is they're small. So those prints shouldn't be super expensive, you know? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, we actually, we had this meetup uh, with uh, our 3D print students and, uh, uh, yeah, what I learned actually from the meetup because we had uh, a bunch of people that are um, that are printed miniatures after taking the course that you can print it as cheaply as like uh, a five dollars and yeah, like yeah. really, really, really cheaply. Um, so there was also a question. Uh, one sec, I kind of lost this uh, from Diego. Yeah, does Martin know for a course about preparing the brush models for 3D printing? Yes, actually. Uh, <laughs> good question. <laughs> Boom. Uh, we'll send everybody a link just in case more people are interested. Um, Taylor is asking, Martin, yeah. what was your first paid modeling gig and how did you find it? Uh, my first paid modeling gig was um, 10 years ago, roughly 10 years ago. And uh, it was back in the days when a lot of people were still uh, um, visiting ZBrush Central. Uh, some people of Hasbro Toys picked up my work and they were asking me that I was available. And I said like, yes to them. And that's how my career started, like by sculpting the first um, uh, weapons for GI Joe figures. That's wow, actually the okay. first, that, that's the first uh, paid job that I ever had uh, when sculpting ZBrush models. Cool. Cool. Um, small and, beginnings. Small beginnings. Everybody then, has uh, small shall beginnings. I ask, shall I shall I ask about the second gig? Because I sometimes <laughs> fall into trap about like asking about the first one, and then turns out that the second gig was like twenty years later. <laughs> <laughs> no, the second gig was also pretty soon uh, after okay, that good. moment. <laughs> but it was was still in the same thing. Like, uh, but then like after a few weapons, a few accessories of those figures, like I did a few um, Iron Man action figures yeah. and then yeah it grows you know because your portfolio grow grows and and yeah that's how it kind of started awesome awesome um okay so uh one last one and then yeah. you know <laughs> so do you recommend work with sculptures in the first part francisco is asking yep i do it all the time like it, I do it all the time because like now in this case, like I'm looking for shapes and I'm moving around bits and pieces and I want to make them, let's say, fit to the figure. And like you see, when you're moving rough around stuff, like your um, your geometry, sorry, geometry gets destroyed and by using sculpts, like you can clean up those parts very fast. And yeah, nine times out of 10, I stay in, in sculptures in, in a pretty far stage, like, when I'm not happy about anything, uh, some st stuff, not anymore. Like then I jump into uh, uh, Z remeshing it, projecting everything, and and yeah, adding some clean topology. Very nice. Um, and meanwhile, Ricardo Alcocer is asking, how do you make yourself noticed by big companies nowadays? Yeah, n nowadays it's it's harder than it used to be because. To be honest, uh, 
if you're motivated, you can find all the all the knowledge that you want online. Um, the thing that I would suggest to people is like, um, if you want to start working in a, in a company and, and be a generalist, just make sure that all your technical stuff is on point because there will people will be people above you that will push you in certain directions uh, art-wise. If you want to be, let's say, more a concept designer or something, like I think it's more important to develop your own style. But the, the, the hardest thing on developing your own style is that uh, it takes time. And, and that's something that you can't force, you know? Um, but that's yeah, true. making sure that, that your portfolio is, is a tiny bit special. I think that's the most important thing. Like if, you, if your portfolio only exists um, out of superheroes, yeah, chances will be big that you only will be hired for superhero gigs, you know? Um, so try to, try to show people that you're, uh, you can sculpt mul multiple things. Like even, I still have to do it quite often, like do a bust or do something that's, let's say, pushed into the real world to still show people like, oh yeah, that's right. He can also sculpt a face, you know? So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. A lot of people tend it's to. It's like uh, it's like uh, showing capabilities beyond the skull, so you can put yeah. some skin on top of the sc on the skull. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, and then Arnold is asking, do you cover how to make an action figure in your course, or you only go over how to print non-articulable parts? Uh, in the course, it's only uh, non-articular parts. Uh, nothing about joints and, and pivots and, and everything that's needed. Um, but you can find some, some stuff from that online very fast, I think. Uh, yeah, I think, um, I think the hardest bit is like actually like uh, engineering the slicing and everything. Yeah, yeah, to make sure that it works. Um, and I would suggest yeah. like if, if you want to go to articulated parts, uh, make sure that you you're covered with all the rest first before you even start thinking about um, having moving bits and pieces on your piece. Good tip. Good, good, good tip. So what's happening on the screen meanwhile? So I'm, I'm making like a beautiful creature, beautiful uh, um, nightmarish creature. But the thing is like, I'm just pushing everything around and I keep, like I said, I keep everything pretty loose. And I'm trying to discover like in which direction I'm going. And the thing is like when I'm sculpting, like I make sure that everything exists out of um, separate subtools so I can modify and tweak those pieces very fast, you know, like I can scale bits and pieces up while working on them um, because I'm still in the discovery stage. And that's what a lot yeah. of people yeah. tend to do yeah, wrong in my eyes. Like when you're working with a base mesh, you're already confined to that base mesh and you can't discover shapes anymore or less. And in this case, like you can tweak, modify, say, okay, this, this proportions work better. Um, and what I tend to do like every time again, like, okay, I want to make lower part of an arm or something, just use a sphere or a capsule or another primitive. And I can easily insert it because I'm working with sculptors, so they don't have any subdivisions. And I can, yeah, start tweaking on this guy again. So masking off parts. Cool. I'm wondering uh, how many uh, do we have actually more uh, artists out there, like here in the stream, actually making something like. Uh, um, I don't know, like a skeleton or or like a, a beautiful nightmarish creature like that. So um, uh, give us a comment or something. Um, if you guys are doing something similar, it would be just interesting to, you know, to check it out after. Like uh, let us know in the comments and maybe, and maybe even uh, uh, send a link that could also work. Could even pull it up now. Um, okay. Um, Martin, yeah, <laughs> there's Marlon who's asking. Oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> What's your hey, favorite Marlon. piece of personal work. What my favorite piece of personal work is, yeah, uh, I don't have any, and the reason why I don't have any is because most of the times I even forget that I've created some pieces. Because, like I told you, when I create stuff, <laughs> it's like you do it in, in a day or two, you know, and then it's out of there. 
And sometimes when I scroll back in my portfolio, I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. I did, yeah, I did that type of demon, <laughs> that type of vampire. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I think I'm completely the opposite than, than Marlon. Like, yeah. you know, I have to work longer than, um, let's say two, three weeks on a model for, for visual effects or something like, I'm completely bored out of my mind. Like I, for me, like the, the, the most fun is the two first days when I'm on the project. And then like it starts dragging on, modifying, tweaking <laughs> and, and nine times out of 10, like my story's kind of told within those two days, you know? Um, wow. Wow. That is impressive. That is impressive. So do you publish then everything or like, you know, well, what's your ratio of <laughs> releasing this? Uh, uh, my personal work. Yeah. Or, uh, I'm guessing that like on, 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 on a daily ratio, I make right, uh, 20 personal works every year or something in total. Oh my God. That's crazy. Marlon is saying that he likes the space monkey. Probably because yeah. that's one of the most realistic ones. Yeah. But that's that bloody monkey keeps, keeps popping up like every now and then, uh, um, like a lot of people actually have tattoos of that monkey. <laughs> um, I hope you guys I, didn't uh, coordinate. <laughs> Again, Marlon, it's my favorite whole tattoo it on my chest. Did you actually? <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> there is like definitely some chemistry going on there. Probably Marlon sh should be uh, moderating the session. <laughs> yeah, but, but like, like, okay, that Space Monkey, it was a fun piece to work on, but I did it uh, during the beta, I think four or five years ago and people still keep coming back to me like, Oh yeah, the space monkey, the space monkey. I'm thinking like I've done so many things in between and, and, and yeah, but you see? to be honest, I love sculpting monkeys. That's the thing. Like when I you realized, a I realized there are a lot of monkeys in there. Monkeys, skulls, golden, like something, like <laughs> <laughs> something swirly bits. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. We've got more questions that are not from Marlon. Uh, so I'm going to, Ban Marlon for a while. And <laughs> there is Adriana. Yeah. Hi, Adriana. What are your favorite artists and what is inspiring you? Okay, let's talk about that. Uh, well, my biggest influences are, let's say, the artists that um, that I grew up with. And I mean, the visual effects artists like Rick Baker and and everybody who was working and is still work, uh, was working for Stan Winston, like uh, Steve Wang and... and Let's say everybody who worked in the industry for the past 30, 40 years, you know, those are still my biggest influences because like those guys uh, inspired me as a kid when I was watching VHS tapes. Um, and let's say on, on true uh, um, real art and not uh, multimedia, um, it can be painters like um, Rembrandt, uh, Caravaggio, um, upper, I mean, like it's my, my spectrum is pretty broad, you know, like cool. I'm not saying like, like I'm going purely for the, um, Giger like things and Brahm and like, it's, it's pretty open, especially. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, um, and then there is one more question here, Eric, where would you start if you have never done any 3d before? <laughs> That's a difficult. I would, one. Like if if I were you, I would definitely start an art heroes course and uh, <laughs> at least to get my feet on the ground. Joking. <laughs> no, I think yeah, but what you're saying is like it's 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 very important to find the right channels that you can learn stuff from, of course. But it's also uh, important to to have, in my eyes, always a background in in uh, real art, like knowing um, how to draw is a big advantage. Knowing how to sculpt is a big advantage. Um, and that can only help you becoming a better artist. And especially like when you want to be a 3D sculptor, I personally think that it's very important to know anatomy uh, of animals, of creatures, uh, um, of uh, human beings. So if you even want to create uh, uh, fancy stuff that it's like based on real reality, you know? Um, and, and yeah. Um, but I would say like, if you want to jump in 3D, like, like 
also try to find a package that's good for you. Um, because like ZBrush isn't for everybody, but uh, uh, 3D Max or Maya or so is isn't also uh, isn't for everybody. Like uh, I'm 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 to be honest, like I'm a total I'm I'm total idiot if you put me in other 3D packages and I hate it. I hate the interface. Uh, I hate that you can't see everything directly when you're working on stuff, that you need to wait for the rendering and everything. That's also when I render stuff, I do it in Keyshot because I can shoot this model to Keyshot instantly and I see what I get and, and I can tweak it a tiny bit more, go back and forth quickly, pull out a render, throw it in Photoshop and done. Like for me, that's very important to be able to work really fast. And for some right. people that are uh, more tinkerers, they want to tweak and they want to refine. And yeah, that's the stuff that I... Yeah, lose too much time for uh, in my case. Right. Yeah. So Eric says that uh, he has background in two D art. I guess that's you know explains that probably he's got already some art background. Yeah, but that's the like okay, just get a copy of ZBrush or the demo and and jump into it and and fall in love with it. You know, with discovering shapes and and sculpting. Like as you as you can see, like. Like what I'm doing now, like how I'm creating this thing, like I haven't even touched the interface practically. I've just switched out between three, four brushes and I'm able to sculpt something, you know? So that's the great thing. Like you don't need to know all the menus that are hidden down here. Like it's eventually it's important to know what's in there, but to start now, like. Yeah, right. No, definitely. Um, I think you can figure out pretty much everything on the way. But um, I definitely heard a lot of comments that some people find it intuitive and some others just like completely the opposite. So yeah, yeah, also, yeah like, right, the good fit. Yeah, a lot of people, especially when they have, let's say, a 3D background and they jump into ZBrush, like they're nine times out of 10, they're completely lost because the interface is totally different. Uh, like what you're doing is different because you're drawing with a pen, you're not working with a mouse. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, like, actually, like, uh, let me ask you guys just uh, um, to hear what you guys have to say. Um, do you find ZBrush intuitive? Like, uh, do you, what's your, in general, what's your opinion? Did you guys, uh, um, like, uh, quickly just fall in love with it? Or was it just forcing yourself to, <laughs> forcing yourself to be creative? <laughs> I it's, mean, it's really, tough like, love. <laughs> tough love, is tough yes. love. <laughs> Just like <laughs> struggling every day for ten years. Like, <laughs> I really I want to know. work with you, but work with me, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, we've got a little lag here, a little bit, uh, as always with, with streams. So I hope we can hear some ZBrush struggle um, <laughs> opinions. In some a people bit. suffering. Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's a monster challenge, you know. Um, we're. Let's see. Sorry. So somebody's saying that the banner on the top left corner is covering the interface. It's okay to hide it. Um, sorry, guys. I can't really hide it right now, but I'll hide it for the next section for the next se for the next session. Since we're already in uh, progress, I can't really tune my interface right now but thanks for the heads up being i did not see that it covers much um yeah i'm not doing a lot of special things the only thing that i might have done is tweak the z intensity a tiny bit that's hidden below workflow <laughs> and maybe the draw size that i was playing with a tiny bit but let's see okay so when i want to insert hands or something like when you go to uh this insert brush you have a lot of different tools that you can choose from and to build up the shapes. I'm just going to use, let's say, something with three fingers because we're creating a monster or something. This is I'm just pulling up a few comments here, meanwhile. So. Yeah. Uh, we've got a lot of, uh, actually, uh, like, for example, we've got Wasim, who is in a love-hate relationship with ZBrush and... Uh, um, we have Julio who just said that uh, for him that was the most similar to traditional sculpting. Mm -hmm. And somebody says that, yeah, learning curve is steep, but once you got it, it's awesome. Yeah, tough love, ZBrush. You know, I learned ZBrush uh, in a 
like I actually bought a book back in the day. <laughs> Uh, and what I did was like I studied that book uh, from the, the cover to the back and um, let's say three months giving this program a lot of tough love uh, I figured out 90% of what I'm, I was doing and yeah that's how it kind of started everything yeah <laughs> I love this comment when I first opened ZBrush I closed it instantly it was super confusing <laughs> Well, ZBrush wasn't for you, I guess. <laughs> well, I can tell you my experience. When I first opened ZBrush, my computer closed instantly because it found it, it found it super confusing. <laughs> like the whole thing, yeah. I would say you have a smart computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just yeah. shuts down. No. So Wasim is actually asking, when do you use alphas to add shapes? Uh, I probably don't. I only do it in the final stage when I want to add uh, uh, certain small details, you know, like skin details or anything. Um, but in the beginning, like my sculpts, like I tend to go in pretty close and then just like use the standard brush um, with uh, the Alpha 38 and, and just like start noodling like crazy on it, especially also for wrinkles or something. Um, Alphas are more for me something as as a filler to add small and interesting details in the end. Uh, never what? Let's say never in this stage while I'm still sculpting. Right. And meanwhile, your character starts getting shapes and even details. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, that's the thing, like I'm floating over my model, spinning it around, looking from all angles and say like, okay, like I might need some some kind of back spine detailing here. So I'm just adding those wiggly lines that people always like joke around. Like, oh, when we see something from Martin, it's like a skull and a lo lot of spirals, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Ali is asking, uh, when looking in references and inspiration, uh, do you have like a final image in your head for the sculpt or figuring it out along the way? Um, yeah, I guess, do you have like a final image in your head? Um, the thing the thing that's important for me, like when I start working on something, like I clearly know which direction I'm going. So I, if I'm creating something with four arms, two arms, four legs, that's for me the most important thing, like what, when I'm discovering everything. But the thing is like when you're drawing around which, uh, and pulling around shapes, like you always have this, this, let's say, happy little accidents. And it's important to also give room to them, you know, like because you might have something in your head and once you put it on, on the canvas or you look at it, at it from a certain angle, it might not work at all. Um, so that's why it's important to, to keep flexible uh, during the whole process, I think. Uh, but yeah, I have a clear idea what I'm going to sculpt or in which direction I will go eventually when I'm uh, working on any piece. Okay, so I might add some shoulder blades or scapula. Am I not distracting you too much with the questions? I'm just thinking, no, no, no. I just, yeah, you're, we're good? Yeah, I'm um, good. Okay, cool. I'm just sculpting so. and talking. <laughs> oh, yeah, awesome. Um, so uh, then I just keep shooting, you know, like, yeah, uh, if get there ready. Are questions, yeah. yeah. Cool. So there's Diago, and the question from Diago, will the course on 3D printing focus on just raising 3D printing or any type will work? Uh, any type, right? I can answer that. Yeah, practically any type. Um, but it's 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 like even when you follow the course, uh, it's good to, to to know the basics because you can apply them in in yeah, like you said, on any type of printing. Uh, it's it's especially focused on the cutting and the keying, and you can use it in in on any type of printer or model. Depends on on the skill that you're going for, of course. Oh, actually, like the model that I showed just before, it's it's through the like this this surfer girl. It's following like Martin's methodology, uh, and it's 3D printed in nylon. So, um, yeah, and uh, uh, we don't have a printer at Art Heroes, so we just outsource the printing with uh, Sculpteo. And um, Sculpteo gives a 20% discount to Art Hero students. You guys uh, end up like taking the course. But anyway, like uh, 
um, whichever printer and whichever direction you decide to go, um, that totally, totally works. Um, so hope that answers Diego. And then next question from Kim. Do you ever feel like you are overworking at work? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. The thing, thing for me is like when I sit still, um, too long, like when I'm, let's say on vacation with my family and you're not doing anything, um, creatively for two weeks, uh, that mentally feels like hell for me. Like I enjoy. You just enjoy described babysitting your own kids. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, but, but the thing, the thing is like, like, like when you're sitting still, like ideas might pop up in your head and the problem is that you can't you can't execute them. You can't make them at that moment. And that's, that's the thing that I always find frustrating. Like, like the thing is like when I start walking or even when I go to the bar or something, or I meet up with somebody like nine times out of 10, like you have an idea or some ideas might pop up in your head that you can try and figure out. And that's like, yeah, I don't have the feeling that I ever overwork. Um, the, the most important thing to clients, I would say, like if you're working for clients is to make sure that you try to build up a good relationship and you, the thing that I try to do is apply office hours. Like um, if there's like, unless there's like a super tight deadline or something and you have to make sure that you, yeah, you made a deadline. Um, then it's important of course to, to deliver the work. But if, if there's like time, just tell your clients like, Hey, I also have a private life, you know? Um, so I don't go overboard with working the whole time. Cool. Um, Niels um, is asking a question. How much creative creative liberty do you take with proportions of limbs and muscles when you're making, for example, a fantasy creature? Um, does, things, does things like focus of muscle replace, sorry, not replacement, placement come a little later after getting the big shapes uh, the way you want? Um, yeah. Um... But I al already try to build it up from the inside out. So I try to when I'm discovering the shapes, like I also try to figure out how the skeleton could be uh, and where stuff needs to be th thicker. But like in this case, like I'm, I'm working now, like you, that's the fun part on working like I'm working now. Like you can tweak and modify stuff. And proportion wise, like I always think it's interesting to to just kick around with that boundary, like like creating stuff that hasn't been seen too much. Like, okay, these arms will be too long maybe for this, for, for a human type creature. But um, by playing around with those shapes, you can also make stuff uh, visually interesting. And then it doesn't have to be not, not, um, geez, not anatomically perfect, you know? Um, if you can create interesting shapes for, for, yeah, for the viewer or for yourself. Right. Yeah, so I guess that's uh, that's also uh, a really cool part about sculpting a monster or not necessarily like uh, a realistic human or, yeah, just uh, just allows a lot of flexibility because you really don't have constraints. Yeah, 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 like you can go any direction. Let's see, let's try to figure out this, something that could be a hit. So do you always start with the body and then add the head yeah because like i tend to to yeah to grow my process from the inside out um, wow that's really peculiar uh because like when i was a kid i made i think i made a mistake of always start drawing the head and then like you come to the body and by the time you arrive by the feet you're you're yeah it's not fun anymore <laughs> so I try to, to I try to shift that focus point from the head to the torso. So I'm like spreading it out uh, instantly to to all directions. So interesting. So interesting. Um, so um, somebody's asking, what's the biggest three D print you've ever made? Uh, that I did for a client or uh, personally. I That's think both count. Um, I still remember the story of a 3D printed leprechaun. Of <laughs> I'm not sure if it was a huge leprechaun or something for the beer company. Um, oh, yeah, Martin that, that, shared that, that, that story like, on yes. the podcast. 
yeah, when we that first was, that, yes. was, that, that was a small one like the biggest print okay. that i've done now for a client was uh, actually a replica of a, a pterodon skull like the flying dinosaur and that's actually life size so that thing was printed uh, a meter 60. jeez so i think that's pretty big you know <laughs> But that was actually a replica skull for somebody um, that has to be, let's say, museum quality uh, with all the cracks and all the all the details on it. Um, wow. Okay. So, um, yeah, okay. Fine. We're not going to go into detail. I'm sure we can have like one million questions about that job. All right. Niels is saying thanks for the answer. No and problem. I think, yeah. I think I skipped a few questions that I wanted to grab. So, uh, can you give some advice on the presentation to you sculpt in the final post from the start um, and uh, some advice on the lighting? I think we've got this planned, right, Martin? Yeah, yeah, we practically got this plan. So, okay, so this is beautiful and it's done. <laughs> now, eventually, like I also <laughs> loaded up, I also loaded up a model that's in a further stage. But as you can see, like this, this sculpting state, like phase goes pretty fast for me. Um, and let's say when I do this for four hours or something, like I have a whole model done, and then it's like kind of looking something like this. Oh wow. So it has uh, a lot more details, a lot more refining. Like if I s zoom in, like even when we're still in sculptures, like there's some small alphas in there just to break up the surface a tiny bit when I go into rendering. And then the thing is like, I kick something like this uh, into Keyshot, do a super simple setup with an HDR and maybe one or two planes to add the light. And most of the times, like even with one render, I jump into Photoshop. I, I can quickly show this. It's magic. Everything's loaded up. Wow, that's magic. <laughs> that's magic. No, so, okay, so we're answering a very important question about presentation. Yeah. Guys, uh, before, you know, Martin, I let him talk more. Um, just he's the god of key shot that's uh again like uh, a few people know that luckily not too many people but he definitely knows how to go around things so martin go yeah okay so when you're in key shot it's very important to study real lightning but it's 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 the same thing then in every uh, um, 3d package that you have to make sure that you create a nice rim light that you load up the hdr to have some reflections in it like these textures are super simple. Like this is a pretty flat image, but then when I take it to Photoshop, I start playing with it. And what I do first is like, I add some interesting information, color gradients. I duplicate my layer. Um, I've added some shadows, like an ambient occlusion pass will, will uh, act like this. And I just masked out bits and parts. And then, like, I just stack one uh, um, gradient on the other. So I use another gradient. And as you can see, like, in here, there's the um, the alpha of the figure. So I'm just uh, applying everything on the figure, not on the background in this stage. Now I'm doing the reverse. So I'm creating also a backlight on my flat image. Um, now I add, add a gradient from top to bottom. These are some simple clouds. Like it's just to break up the surface, like like what you're looking at. And also like by adding these small steps, like I'm adding more and more focus on my character. So I'm trying to pull it out of the image. Just add a layer with some clouds on it. And I stack it up and then like, I just play around with, with uh, the multiply settings, the green uh, screen settings, uh, the, the uh, overlay and try to figure out until I have something that I like. Then I add some simple highlights. Like just by adding this simple layer in overlay, like these are just white gradients, like I can show you quickly. Um, like it's nothing more than a small sphere that I drag in and the blending mode is an overlay, but by doing this, like, and you add it to the highlights, then these things actually 
pop up in your render and make sure that it's like, like it, it adds the focus to your character, right? Adding a bit of smoke on the bottom. Add a color overlay. Add some debris or smoke or snow. Just add some atmosphere to it. So it's, it's bringing the whole thing to life step by step. And as you can see, I'm not touching my model. For me, it's very important. Like if I tweak my model, I only do it in the final stage because, like I'm, I, like I said, I'm, I'm a concept sculptor, and quite often it happens that I'm, I'm preparing something for a client, and he likes that image or the presentation, but they also want to use the 3D model uh, in the rest of the pipeline. And when you start tweaking and modifying and doing a paint over in Photoshop, like you have to redo everything that you already did in 2D, and you have to make it match in 3D. And for me, that's very important to to yeah, not touch my model too much when I'm working on it. We've got one million questions all over a sudden. Okay. Let's start just like quickly. Do you bring the entire figure or uh, parts of the figure into Photoshop? That's Eric. Uh, it's 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 a complete figure. So first in Keyshot, then I do the render, and I might do one or two render passes like in different materials, but then I blend it in Photoshop. I just put it over in, in overlay and by adding masks, like I paint out stuff and add stuff. Um, it's super straightforward. Um, but I try to give it, let's say the, in Photoshop, my render is the extra bling that it's kind of missing in the raw renders that are coming out of um, Keyshot directly, so. Right. Um, I struggle a lot with materials not looking best in BPR. Any suggestions regarding that? Um, and does he, she wants to do renders in photo and in, in, in ZBrush or is it for presentation or because good question. Well, let's see what they answer. Um, so I don't know. I don't know, but let's assume that's for, um, presentation. Yeah, so presentation, it's 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 super important in photo and in, in ZBrush when you use BPR that you also export all the different um, shadow passes and everything, and then when you put it in in Photoshop that you can blend everything together. Um, like it's really hard to get one render pass out of ZBrush in BPR that looks super nice. Like it's easier to have a light uh, from the left, the right, the top. And then like tweaking it and adding a rim light and putting everything in Photoshop, uh, in Photoshop on top of each other. And then like tweaking uh, the different settings. Um, yeah, that's yeah. My, my best advice that I can give you. Um, right. Try not to do everything in one uh, go when you do everything in, 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 uh, in, in ZBrush. I also do it in Keyshot, like nine times out of 10. Like I take out three, uh, two, three render passes, very simple. Yeah. And I just compose them, so. Actually, building on top of your key shot comment, um, Ricardo is asking uh, whether you think that recruiters look more uh, about final presentation or technical execution of the sculpt. And uh, sometimes he thinks that he kills the potential of his sculpt with the lacking key shot render. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the thing, like, yeah, no, but th th that's very important. Like, um, you can have the perfect ZBrush sculpture and you throw it in a package and you and you don't light it correctly, it will be totally destroyed. Um, the only advice that I would give uh, is, is make sure that you use a simple light setup with three points or something. And also always do the presentation. If you want to present a sculpt, uh, a clay render should be good enough. Like without all the textures and everything, just the, uh, the gray, uh, uh, let's say, um, clay shaders that are in key shots, uh, apply them to, to the model. Uh, and that should be good enough for a recruiter to see like your sculpting abilities. Um, because you can cheat quite a lot also in, in, in texturing. Like sometimes you see work of people and it looks like astonishing, but then when you see the ZBrush model, it's like, yeah, super simple, but they got, <laughs> but they got away with a lot of textures, you know? <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. Um, finally, um, do you export polypaint straight to um, the key shot? Yeah, yeah. So do okay. all the if I if I have polypaint on my model, uh, I kick it to key shot. 
Uh, I switch out the materials because you can switch out the materials in key shots and keep the poly paint. Um, and that's actually the only texturing that I do in all the pieces that I, that I have, like uh, poly paint, key shot. Like I said, I'm, I'm like kind of an <laughs> a technical idiot in, in, in that fact, you know? Well, <laughs> if that's how you describe that. Um, so um, what do we have left for today, Martin? Uh, like uh, we've got, you know, a lot of questions, but uh, let, tell me what's in your agenda, what still we have uh, not covered. Well, we got most of the things covered. Like I'm al almost on the top of the stack that, <laughs> that I'm showing. Okay. So roughly this is the final image. Wait, let's see. So I do a color pause on it. Like I'm just tweaking with gradients again. And what I've done is like, this is just a, a simple lens distortion that's on the whole thing. And what I might do is with liquify brush, I tweak a few bits, sharpen it up and add another curve to make sure that all the colors pop. And that's practically how something looks when it's finished. So let's pull this guy up again. Let's see. So this is what I come from as a raw render. And just by going through Photoshop, I go to this. Oh, and wow. I haven't really, and I haven't really tweaked or let's say uh, um, repaint my model. The only thing that I did was like stacking on gradients, make sure that my focal point is, is set on the figure, that I push back the background and try to get everything uh, that I want. So that how I many like layers are there in total roughly? Uh, I would say roughly 20 because I don't see how much you scroll, whether we're talking about like tens or hundreds. <laughs> no, no, it's, 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 it's roughly 20 layers or something, 15, 20 layers in total, but that's most of the times, but it's like something simple, like, like having a smoke layer or, or some, some, some snow and, and some blending and then some vignetting and like. But the fun part is that you also can tweak and, and, and play with those things like when you're working on it, you know, when you feel like you're losing the focus of your character just by adding light. So in this case, like if you say, oh, like I've lost my figure completely, I just add a layer, put it in overlay modes, add a gradient cool. here, and there it is again, yeah. you know? And then you can dial it back because you're like, let's say burning out colors. I say, okay, I want to add some more detail to this. BC is saying, damn, that's awesome. I second that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so no, that's definitely awesome. So um, a question here from Diego again, how many hours of work was that? I think that's this, a pretty important question. Uh, in total for me, this was seven, eight hours or something. From, from beginning to final end. Most of the times I lose the most time in, uh, uh, in yeah, getting the renders because yeah, you preset everything. So you wait for 15 minutes for every pass. So that's where I lose the most time and actually compositing everything together. I, I lose a lot of time. Like it even happened to me in the past that I work on a project for myself and uh, for 3D print and the 3D printing takes longer than the actual sculpt. So, wow. so, you know, basically, uh, bottom line, uh, you could definitely, or like, you could definitely do it as a part of a one week challenge. <laughs> oh yeah. You can do it as a one day challenge. <laughs> <laughs> no, Martin, I'm sorry. This is too depressive. <laughs> no, no, no. But it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's important when you're sculpting that you always have fun, like when you're playing around with your shapes and, and the thing that I always tell students when I'm teaching. Uh, people uh, try not to think too much and try to sculpt with, with, with your feeling, you know, like, because a lot of times when I'm teaching students, like they're losing way too much time overthinking their, their concepts. And I'm telling them like, stop thinking, start sculpting, you know, create something like you can think about a shape. As long as that shape isn't on the screen, I, I will not talk to you. Nice. Nice. Okay, that's a that's a really good tip. Well, to be fair, uh, during this challenge, we really don't have too much time for thinking, um, because you know, for many people, it's the first sculpt ever, um, yeah. like first time opening ZBrush. Oh, I mean, we've got a bunch of pros as well. 
Uh, so yeah, it's a pretty fun combination. Um, so uh, guys, as we're rounding up, let us know what you think. Just uh, you know, what's um, any thoughts on the sculpt? Because on our agenda, um, I also wanted to announce the homework for tomorrow and uh, like a little assessment. And we still have a raffle for today. So we're going to be random picking somebody uh, who submitted um, and submitted the assessment from yesterday and also um, and also is still here. So, uh, uh, yeah, we see a bunch of uh, comments. Oh, yeah, a question here from Taylor. Meanwhile, we're on it. So you don't retopologize. Uh, I do it in the end if it's necessary, if I want to add some extra details or something. Uh, and of course, like when I'm working for a pipeline, like it happens sometimes when you do the concept sculpt and then you have to push it along uh, for the production and that, yeah, that I also deliver the high res assets. And then, yeah, of course, like I do everything on the new topology and stuff uh, and so on. So, cool. But, yeah, in this stage, it isn't important for me. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, Martin, um, like, are you going to finish this or that's going to go to your uh like to be finished at some point what's like what's the plan with this guy this guy well are you not... gonna participate in the monster challenge now <laughs> well can i participate <laughs> well to start with your jury yeah so that's the thing we can, we can <laughs> um yeah guys so um we can probably you know uh ask the audience if if you can participate if you're not judging your own thing, well, probably you can be, you know, popular vote. vote. <laughs> well, I, I, I with know. this guy, I'm, I'm, I don't even know what I'm going to do with it because, like, quite often I also throw away work, like something like this when when I start on something, like because I'm not saying this this is like say a, a throwaway quality, but I can resculpt this thing again in in, in forty minutes or something. So so yeah. Well, cool. So, um, okay, uh, guys, then I'm going to go ahead now and uh, announce the um, assignment for tomorrow. And uh, then we're going to announce the um, uh, giveaway winner. So for tomorrow, we're going to do next. Uh, for tomorrow, our team has already opened the day two uh, submission tab. So you can find it in the Facebook group for the Monster Challenge. Uh, actually, it's been pretty amazing. I think uh, we're counting. And for day one, we have uh, around 150 or 160 whips. So that's that's crazy. Um, yeah, a lot of monsters. A lot of monsters and uh, really cool levels. So... Um, for tomorrow, um, when you post your uh, screenshot of your web, also uh, write us what are the new techniques that you want to try this time. Because as you guys are probably learning or still improving, maybe there is like something new that you want to test this time around. And we were just thinking that it would be cool for other um, other artists in this you know, in this crew, just uh, get inspired of just a few different tests or just tools that you can try. Maybe that's something that you heard today from Martin or from Marlon yesterday. Uh, just, you know, maybe that's something that you've been wanting to try, like at any level. Martin, and do you actually now still try different things with your uh, characters? Like new uh, things? New techniques. Yeah. 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 Like, uh, to be honest, like until three, four years ago, like I was using most of the times base meshes, like uh, building everything up in Z spheres. Uh, and just by talking with other artists and listening to their workflows, I was like, oh, maybe I should try this, this. And that's how I actually have ended up with, with let's say, the workflow that I'm applying now and, and that I'm completely happy with. Um, so, yeah, I'm still learning and tweaking everything. Uh, um, in my workflow when well, I work on pieces. I'm really, I'm really, you know, happy to hear that it's it was important for you to try new things. So yeah, guys, and we would be super happy to hear if you um, also try something new. Um, yeah, with uh, this character, is it a rabbit now? Is it just? <laughs> I can make it a rabbit if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, like. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. No, Marlon is making a rabbit. Uh, I'm like, fine. There's like a flash mob or something. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Absolutely love that. Okay. So uh, let me turn on my uh, randomizer. And guys, uh, we've got one more uh, Art Heroes cap that will go to somebody. And uh, uh, I'm just going to see who is this lucky person um, today. So uh, give me a second. And um, like, meanwhile, I'm just pressing the button and the machine will uh, do the magic and choose the name. So um, let's see if Taylor McBrown is online. Okay, so we've got a little delay. Taylor McBrown, congrats with uh, uh, with my favorite cap. You definitely got it. And so if you're online, you should definitely shout out now. But what you also should do is please uh, text us. Oh, yes, Taylor, amazing. <laughs> Okay, he's online. Uh, please uh, text us, uh, text Art Heroes page on Facebook, and our team will get back to you and we'll ship this uh, cap to you tomorrow so that you could probably wear it for the celebration week uh, next week. Yeah. So, uh, congrats, Taylor. Um, I'm glad you're online. Uh, that's it. Um, Martin. Yeah. Um, if you end up finishing the Skull Rabbit, Rabbit Skull, <laughs> <laughs> or whoever that is. Like, uh, um, by the way, how do you name your characters? Like, do you give them like names afterwards or before? Um, that's interesting. Like, they always have a working name when I'm during the process, and like when it's done and it's finished, like it just pops in my head, <laughs> like every time. It's really Amazing. weird. Like, like, like when I say about something, it can be, let's say. Um, uh, a bog witch or something, you know, or a forest witch or whatever. And like in the end, it will be like a specific, a very specific name that's, uh, yeah, that belongs to that character. Amazing. So um, if you finish this, we would love to post that, you know, and see what actually happened. Um, yeah. So uh, give me an update what happens with uh, with this one and uh, um, we'll post it also on the challenge group so that uh, the uh, happy crowd together with Taylor who says that he uh, literally never win anything. Just made my day. Okay, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, high five to that, Taylor. <laughs> Good things happen <laughs> from time to time. Okay, so um, that's it, guys. Uh, Martin, are yes. we good to go? I think so. Yeah, amazing. Has it, has it well, has been interesting? Uh, well, guys, how has that been? Like, uh, he, like the the you know the MC uh, Martin Verhoeven is curious. Um, like, give us some love, so that we know that that was uh, that was helpful. If now it was. it's silence. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, like, you know, we've got the lag. So <laughs> I'm still reading a bunch of messages like, congrats, Taylor. Taylor, congrats. <laughs> well, you're good for man. you, Taylor. <laughs> Taylor, you're the man. <laughs> okay, no, now the leg is done. <laughs> and uh, uh, if you see the comment, there is like a little froggy. That's probably to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, there is a uh, uh, high five. And of course it was, and uh, um, uh, it is amazing. I like the flow of the character. It is alive. Uh, it's great. Uh, awesome. Okay. Thank you guys. Um, it's amazing how far you can take it in such a short amount of time. I think this is the major takeaway. Um Okay, uh, Vin learned new techniques and the rabbit looks sick. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, the webinars make it all worth it. Yes, uh, thank you, 
I will try everything, learn a lot, blah, blah, 100 out of 10. Whoa. Um, amazing. Thank you, guys. Okay. Wow. All right. No, thank you guys all for showing up and uh, for, you know, making our day. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Okay. This flew by. Yeah. So um, I'm turning this off then. And uh, don't forget that tomorrow, still post your whips. I'll ask Martin to post his whip as well. <laughs> And uh, um, yeah, so tomorrow, same time, we've got the sessions, second session with uh, Marlon. He's probably finalizing his sculpt and he's going to do a session on storytelling. So that's a good one. You should attend. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the same time? It's the same time. You've got a lot of storytelling to do with this guy. <laughs> Sorry, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, it all started five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know okay <laughs> so uh storytelling with characters tomorrow same time same place guys and uh, uh post your whips uh we've got another prize tomorrow and i promise there is also something new okay martin thanks goodbye my pleasure <laughs>